Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To all of you. Rob Burhan, the speakers. Uh, uh, Fazil Munir. Rob Burhan is with us from Turkey. And Fazil Munir is with us from uh, uh, Jakarta, a village. Uh, 15 minutes by train from the city center of Jakarta. And today we are very lucky. We are given an opportunity by Allah the Exalted to discuss a very important issue. Although the number of people who are joining us live on Zoom is only uh, a few people, but this uh, webinar will be shared later on YouTube. And inshallah, we will have many, many more uh, viewers there who will be enlightened with what is happening uh, with our uh, Muslim brothers and sisters uh, in in the Chinese Republic, yeah, uh, in the Republic of no, I'm sorry, in the People's Republic of China. It's very sensitive these issues, yeah. This naming is very sensitive. So here, uh, mute. Who is okay? Never mind. Uh, here is my uh, slide introduction and. The title for our webinar today is uh, A Safe Uyghur, A Global uh, Responsibility. And the video for this later you can see at bit.ly uh, Surya channel. Perhaps uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Burhan and Ahmad, you can mute your phone, your laptops. So I can hear voices uh, from the background, yeah? Uh, I will request that you mute your uh, uh, laptops. Okay. And uh, my name is Surya Dalimonte. At the moment, uh, uh, I'm having this webinar in a coffee shop in Medan. It's called Sansuri Cafe Shop. You can see it's very nice, the background, yeah, which is uh, in contrast with the plight of our uh, Uyghur uh, 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 Muslim uh, family, yeah. So it seems that at the moment Muslims uh, are targeted around the world. So we have uh, this movement in the United States, uh, lobby lobbying movement and NGO Justice for All, and at the moment one of them uh, is a Safe Uyghur campaign. Uh, SafeUyghur.org is the website. Later I will show you, and also there are uh, three more current. Uh, uh, movement, yeah, Burma Task Force, Myanmar for the Rohingyas, uh, uh, Save India for our uh, Indian Muslim brothers and sisters, Free Kashmir for Kashmir, and this the Bosnia Task Force has Task Force has ended. But everywhere, all around the world, not only Muslims, uh, uh, humanity is in crisis now, not only because of the pandemic, the COVID nineteen. Uh, virus, coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, a variety of uh, uh, neoliberal and capitalist uh, 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 encroachment into the lives of uh, uh, citizens and residents all around the world, yeah, immigrants. And here, you can see the respective uh, websites, yeah, for Uyghur is safeuyghur.org, Burma Task Force.org, for Rohingyas, justiceforall.org slash safe India for our Indian Muslim family, uh, freekashmir.org or Kashmir, uh, and the one that has passed uh, last decade is Bosnia Task Force, justiceforall.org slash Bosnia Task Force, and many others. So we have a global crisis, especially befalling Muslims. And hence, we need to uh, shoulder the responsibility to save uh, our Muslim family and humanity in general. So we will have a presentation by Professor Burhan Uluyol. Uh, he is uh, working at the Istanbul Sabahatin Zaim uh, University, yeah, abbreviated as IZU. And he received from Erdogan, as you can see there, an outstanding 
Young Scientist Award by Turkey Academy of Sciences for 2018 and to 2021. So the award is not yet lapsed yeah? There's still a year more to go. He was an associate assistant, then associate professor and senior lecturer, and I, I believe head of study program uh, at the International Islamic University, Malaysia and University Kuala Lumpur. So I get this uh, short bio from Research Gate, I think, and also from his uh, uh, why I from his research get paper also, yeah. Uh, and uh, he has written, uh, I think, maybe more now because uh, recently he said that he has published uh, uh, at least one more paper, yeah, reputable article on in international journal. So he has published in addition to that four books, eleven book chapters, and around. 55 uh, reputable articles. He, uh, he was awarded or he was given uh, the distinction of being a top 1% reviewer in 2018 and 2019. So very recent by Pablo Ancia, yeah? uh, reviewing website, reviewing record website. And his specialty is empirical studies of Islamic banking and finance. And after him, later we will have Fazil Munir, I used to call him Ahmad. He's a friend. Uh, he was an exchange student in NUS, uh, where I was also uh, a student. And in fact, I had an Uyghur friend, a very close Uyghur friend there, whom I tried to contact, uh, but couldn't reach him. Abdul Qayyum is his name. Later, if we have time, I will show you my photo with him, which I have shown to Ahmad or Fazil and uh, Prof. Burhan. So Fazil is now guest lecturer at Universitas Ahmad Dahlan, Yogyakarta. Uh, also, he acts on the side as an as an attorney for immigration immigration legal work uh, for a law firm in the U.S. Yeah, I guess he does this uh, uh, online. Yeah, and he was a translator of Guidance of the Intelligent to the Path of the Saints, a medieval Sufi poem and its commentaries by Sheikh Zain Zainuddin Al Malabari. I think this is Indian, yeah, Malabar. And he is a Muslim activist. At the moment, if you go to his Facebook feed, Twitter feed, uh, he focuses very much on Uyghur issues. Keep updating uh, his friends, including me, about what is happening uh, to the Uyghur and the responses all around the world regarding the issue. Uh, so he has disseminated many articles on, on the plight of the Uyghurs on social media, as well as recently he published two articles, one on a European website and the other on a, a more global website, if I'm not mistaken. And later, last but not least, we'll have Sohibul Ansor Siregar, who is a lecturer at Universitas Muhammadiyah Sumatera Utara, Medan. He currently heads the Wisdom and Public Policy Unit of the Pengurus Wilayah Muhammadiyah, ya, Muhammadiyah Regional Administration of North Sumatera, and he is also the Coordinator Umum, General Coordinator for NBASIS, Pengembangan Basis Sosial dan Inisiatif Swadaya. He is a newspaper columnist, Waspada, uh, the main newspaper in North Sumatra, but this newspaper is nationally distributed. I believe uh, Fazil, if he looks for it uh, in Jogja, he can find it somewhere. Uh, he is also a public intellectual and speaker, often on uh, uh, Muslim issues all around the world, including the Uyghurs. He has written and presented a lot on Uyghurs. And last but not least, he is also a political consult consultant. So, hashtag Save Uyghur, very important. We have, uh, for Muslims alone, right now about 1.8, I rounded up to 2 billion, uh, around about one fourth, which is 8 billion of the world population. So definitely if we unite, even a small number of us unite, let's say 1%, 1% is already 20 million, I think or 200 million, even 2 million of us unite to help the Uyghur, I, get, I think it, it will put a lot of pressure into the Chinese government and their allies here, yeah, who are, uh, as Prof. Burhan said in his article, conducting an open genocide, not only culture, but religion, uh, and other aspects of the Uyghur life. Yeah? So, but I'm not limiting this to Muslims only, the whole world, you know, uh, the whole humanity need to save need to save itself from each other, and uh, this is actually technical. Uh, so we can. This is one means of saving it. 
So at the moment, the Chinese are very powerful because they are lending a lot of countries money, including I think uh, Pakistan, Indonesia, maybe even Turkey. And by that, uh, they have a lot of power so that these Muslim countries, the leaders, does not dare to speak openly against uh, uh, China, yeah? against the People's Republic of China. But we have a new uh, macroeconomic theory which states that countries with their own currency need not borrow uh, from foreign uh, country as long as they have real resources, meaning humans, uh, uh, tools, natural resources available. So they need not borrow from countries. So there's no need for Pakistan, for Indonesia, for, for uh, Afghanistan, for Turkey, actually, to borrow from foreign countries if they have real resources. So it's called Modern Monetary Theory. So I recently translated the book on the right, Macroeconomics, 600 plus pages to Indonesian. And we are having a webinar with all of these people, all, the, all of these professors. I have been in touch with them for a year now, more than a year, uh, to, to uh, show that, for example, Indonesia, can have monetary sovereignty, can have job guarantee, can have industrial policy and not rely on countries such as the United States or China so that we can become independent, so that we can help our fellow Muslim uh, uh, brothers and sisters around the world. Indonesia, as the largest Muslim country in the world, has this responsibility and must play this responsibility uh, 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 as some sort of a guardian or some sort of a helper uh, uh, to the Muslims and humanity around the world. So I will end with this, yeah. The believers are like one body in their mutual love and affection. If one limb is injured, the rest responds with sleeplessness and fever. In fact, yesterday, I, Afrilia, and Sohibul, we will work late until perhaps 12 o'clock at night uh, at a coffee shop. And when we return home, I, we still couldn't sleep and work on this until 2 or 3 uh, p.m. Such is a.m., I'm sorry. Such is the importance of this uh, uh, webinar, yeah. So thank you very much. That's my contact. And after this, Prof. Burhan, uh, uh, perhaps uh, he can present on his uh, uh, research gate article. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm sorry. On, on to you, Prof. Burhan. You can share your screen. Uh, or can you share share for me as well if you want? I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. Okay, I will share your screen. Uh, now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Actually, uh, we have translated your articles into Indonesian. But, ah, mashallah. And also Fazils, yeah. Uh, I will show you uh, soon, yeah. Uh, let me. Why I? Okay. Stand up against the. Okay. Here is your article, yeah. Thank you. One moment, yeah. Let me. Okay. Let me open it up. Okay. Okay, we have it here, and let me share my screen. Admit. Share screen. One sharing open. Okay, multiple. Let me share this. So here is your article, and okay. we, we have translated it into Indonesian, which we, we will uh, share at the YouTube description video later. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, thank you and, so much. Yeah, we have also translated Basil Saltic articles into, so English article we translate into Indonesian. Uh, so Fazil has two articles, and Sohibul has two articles. We have translated into English so that uh, all of us can, can read it, yeah? And here is now uh, your article. You can, you can ask me to scroll down, yeah, uh, Prof? Uh, yeah. You can start now. Okay, okay. Can you just speak down? I mean, go to the first page. I will. Yeah. Okay, uh, assalamu alaikum for everyone, uh, especially uh, special thanks to Brother Surya as well. And also thanks for uh, those, the one who concern uh, with uh, not only with the Uyghurs, and also the one who concern with uh, humanity, actually. Okay, so I do appreciate everyone uh, here 
uh, to uh, listen to my uh, seminar. Uh, let me uh, start officially uh, my presentation. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone. So just now, uh, Burhanul Surya is introduced uh, myself as Burhan Uluyul, but I used to be uh, known as uh, Burhan Saiti. That is according to a uh, Chinese passport, actually. But recently, I earned my Turkish citizenship. Uh, that's why I become a Turkish uh, citizen. So uh, just now, also Burhanul Surya is uh, introduced uh, my profile, actually. Uh, I mean. Uh, I, I can say I am one of the successful academician. I was a peaceful academician until year of 2018. Okay, so I was in Malaysia uh, for 12 years actually. Uh, I was in uh, Malaysia. So I did my master, I did my PhD and also uh, I, I earned my PhD in 2012. Then after that I worked in University of Kuala Lumpur and also International Islamic University of Malaysia for, I mean, two different universities for six years. So I don't want to mention, okay, I don't want to mention, I mean, what I did and how I did my academia. So uh, you can say that, I mean, the war from, uh, I mean, the president of the Turkey, uh, Rajab Erdogan, is showing how successful academician I am. The today's story is not on that, but what we face uh, in uh, China, actually. Okay, uh, so uh, just go to the top, I mean, just at top of the Erdogan uh, picture. Uh, okay, so here, okay. I mean, uh, many people, they thought the issue with the Uyghurs is a religion, actually. To me, the issue is, is more than the religion. The issue is more than cultural identity, who we are, actually. The issue is more than racism. The, it is humanitarian crisis against the humanity. Okay, so it is comprehensive genocide. Okay, comprehensive genocide towards against Uyghur in terms of culture, in terms of the religion, and uh, in terms of identity. So I, I uh, actually, as I mentioned just now, I was peaceful academician until a uh, uh, year 2018. I, I I used to go back to my hometown to visit my parents. So my last visit was 2015. So, uh, but starting from 2016, end of 2016, the Chinese government started the comprehensive, or what they call is the attack uh, on the Uyghurs. Uh, also, uh, after 2018, uh, for example, uh, I, I just I told you, I came to uh, uh, Turkey uh, end of 2017, yeah, beginning of 2018. I, I will never involve any politics because I, if I involve any politics, the Chinese government will be smashed or they will destroy my family, actually. So meaning that uh, in order to contribute to academia, I was kept silent until uh, 2018. Uh, it doesn't mean the oppression is not there. The oppression is actually last 70 years. Okay, to do a pulu tahun. So meaning that the last 70 years of oppression is there, but the oppression is not like right now, actually. Okay, so in the beginning, I mean, they do a lot of restriction. Uh, we cannot uh, go to the mosque or we cannot go to madrasa, you know, or we cannot, uh, I mean, if the government stuff, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. I mean, some restriction is there. But I mean, uh, it reach to the biggest point or the highest end point, or they come to the, what they call is the comprehensive uh, attack on Uyghurs starting from end of 2016. So meaning that they started the comprehensive and genocide uh, uh, starting from the end of that 2016. But I told you just now, I was kept silent until okay they will touch my mother and my father and also my sisters and also my uncles actually so meaning that end of 2000 uh, uh, middle of 2016 uh sorry it it was uh, 2017 yes uh, it's end of middle of 2017 they arrested my uncle the first uncle i i mean uh, his name is Ahmed Yaqub the one in number 4 Okay, number four, Ahmed Yaqub. So I keep silent because if I speak up him, I worry they will detain my father and my mother and also my siblings. Then after that, number five, 
uh, I mean, the uncle, Mehmet Yakub, he was arrested uh, in the uh, middle of 2018 as well. Again, I keep silent, okay? Because if I speak something again, they will do something my family members. Then after that, they started with my uncles, they my cousins, and so on and so forth. I keep silent because, I mean, uh, I, I have to protect my family members as well. Even though I am like uh, a very, I mean, not respecting, but I, I mean, I worry about safety of my family members, but it is uh, 2000, uh, sometime o October 2018, they arrested my mother. My mother is 60 years old, and more than 60 years old, and she never again do anything, uh, I mean, Chinese government. So from this picture, you can see that actually, he, she just, I mean, the photo is taken just a few days before he being sent to the concentration camp. Okay, concentration camp. Then after that, okay, after that, they arrested my mother. I came to, actually, uh, my sister, she didn't tell me what happened to my mother, my mother, but, okay, uh, after a few, few days later, they also arrested my sister. Then after that, my sister is sent to me some uh, message saying that mother and the, my sister is arrested. Then I immediately, I'm contacting with the Chinese officials, immediately release my family members. Otherwise, I will speak up at international level and international community. Okay, so because they know, I mean, I'm a little bit a public figure because I'm a little bit influential. And also I have some voice recording by the chief police of my hometown. Then I'm threatening him. If you don't release my mother, okay, or my sister, then I will release uh, this voice recording to international level or I will expose this rec voice recording to the international level. Then after that, she she quite worried. I uh, sorry he he quite worried and immediately re released my sister. Okay, immediately released my sister. I mean the same day she being released. Then I came to know actually uh, it works actually. Then after that, okay, I talked to my sister. How about mother? Actually, the mother is taken to the construction camp like one week ago. Okay, one week ago, but I didn't tell you. If I tell you, Chinese government, they will do something for us, actually. Then after that, I'm again sending the voice message to that chief police. I mean, I demand that to release my mother as well. So after like 10 days later, my mother was being released from that concentration camp. Can you go to that picture just now, uh, my, my mother's photo? Uh, uh, yes, this one. So you can imagine, after just a few days later, okay, after being released from the concentration camp, uh, and my mother is asked to remove her scarf, actually. Okay, I mean, and her face is quite changed, and also, okay, and also uh, she, uh, she was asked to remove her scarf. Then, actually, I didn't know where she's being locked up, actually. But after like one month ago, I came to know that she's being sent to the underground prison. Okay, underground prison in my hometown, actually. It, it used to be there is no prison in my hometown, but because of the construction camp, they built, I mean, the underground prison. So someone told me my mother is being sent to that underground prison. So then after that is, I started to, wake up and I, I try and um, what they call is uh, I, I, uh, I stand with my people. Then I told the Chinese government, now the issue is more than my mother. The issue is more than my mother. Then I have to stand with the Uyghur people. Then I become the activist starting from end of the 2018 because of my uh, father, because of my mother and because of my uncles as well. Then uh, I mean, I just want to cut uh, in. I mean, my, my father also uh, being sent to the construction camp, even though uh, he is, uh, you see, he just hospitalized. My, my father was hospitalized and uh, three times surgeries just before, few months before he being sent to concentration camp as well. So meaning that even they sent my, my father to the construction camp as well. But then after that, 
Okay, after that, I mean, uh, I also, I'm negotiating with the Chinese government or I'm demanding them uh, to release on him as well. So he's being released after 10 days later as well. Okay, so meaning that, uh, I mean, they, they arrested my father, they arrested my mother, and they arrested my sister as well. Maybe you thought, okay, you maybe you thought, I mean, they captured my, my parents because of me. No. In the beginning, I never against Chinese Communist Party. I told you before, even I go back to my hometown to visit my parents every one year or every two years, actually. Okay? Actually, I stand up or I become the vocal activist. Okay? I mean, after uh, they, they captured my parents, actually. Okay? So, meaning that, what I want to hear, I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters in Islam, and also I do appreciate, of course, even though, uh, I mean, uh, Indonesia is not really advanced country, but I mean, people are really advanced, okay? I, 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 I mean, I'm not exaggerating or I'm not doing anything, but Alhamdulillah, you are the one who stand at least, okay? I mean, I mean at governmental level, you cannot do much, but at least, I mean, the civilian, okay, you did a lot for the Uyghur people as well. I do appreciate, I mean, uh, many uh, public figures or many, I mean, what they call is at least, okay, much better than many other countries. At least you speak up. I mean, just now, I do appreciate the works by Syria, okay? He mentioned, okay, I mean, at least, at least you're standing with the humanity, actually. So what I want to tell you uh, here, uh, today, uh, I just uh, want to give as example, you may thought, you know, uh, just can you go to, I mean, the one, the list, uh, Brother Surya, uh, Brother Surya, the list, the, who's taking it are uh, here, okay? So, I mean, this is, uh, can you just, no, 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 I mean, uh, I mean, the big list, the big list, I mean, down, down, ah, uh, here, here, yes. Okay, so you can imagine from here, uh, can you just show the number one as well? Yes, so uh, after, okay, after they release my father and my mother, my sister, then, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, that is December 2018, I got the award from, I mean, the president of the Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Then after that, they didn't do anything for my family members. So meaning that they didn't do anything my father, they didn't do anything my mother, or and but my sister is arrested in another four or five months, actually, because I know that. Uh, but now she's be being released from the concentration camp as well. But now my family members are the safe. Now, my brother-in-law, Ismail Krem, Okay, it's actually, uh, his name is supposed to be Abdul Karim, Ismail Abdul Karim, uh, but we just call Karim actually. And Muhammad Ismail and my stepbrother, he's still in the construction camp as well. And also, uh, I heard Yusuf Yaqub is now is being released, but Ibrahim Yusuf, uh, I mean, uh, from here, but I don't know Ismail Yusuf and Akaila Kazvera are they, but definitely Ahmed Yaqub, Muhammad Yaqub, uh, and also, uh, uh, another, I mean, some of them is already being released, okay? I mean, but at least uh, um, half of them in the still in the concentration camp, actually. Even though the China is trying to tell the fake news to the world, but this is what's happening to our family members. So, even now, yes, uh, it's true, actually, they, they release some people, but the most of the people still in the concentration camp, okay, concentration camp, uh, and also the sentencing for 10 years, uh, to, uh, 15 years, like uh, jail, a lifetime jail term, and so on and so forth. I mean, they're what they call is, uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean, jailing the people for many years. I heard Ahmed Yaqub is jailed for 15 years, okay. And also, Mehmet Yaqub is jailed for 15 years as well. And many people is already being jailed. Now, I want to tell you another uh, or story, not my, my story, okay, not my story. There is a lady, okay, she's a very secular woman. And she's a very secular Uyghur woman. Actually, I want to invite her as well, but because of the time constraint, and also I'm very busy as well here, I'm, uh, I'm doing a 
lot of uh, activity for the Uyghur. even now the meeting is on for the Uyghur people in Istanbul actually so anyway I'm, I'm busy so I just I want to tell you her story uh, she is from the same city with me she's very secular very modern uh, woman okay so uh, what happened uh, she never speak against Chinese Communist Party, a very secular woman, and also she's graduated from one of the top university in China as well. Actually, myself as well. I, I, I graduated from one of the top university in China as well, nearby the Beijing or nearby the Peking, actually. So I was also one of the top students uh, when I was in China as well. So, uh, and also she's bridging between Turkey and the China. I mean, she's a lawyer, so she did a lot of, I mean, activities to bridging Turkey and uh, what they call this China as like bridging the two countries, okay? Uh, she doesn't know anything about Islam, to be honest, because, I mean, uh, she is the product of the Chinese Communist Party, actually, okay? And I want to tell you like this. Her father and her mother is a member of Chinese Communist Party, a member of the CCP. Okay, the mother is chemistry professor. The father is the government servant, and they're very loyal to the Chinese, uh, the Chinese government. Okay, you can imagine you are a member of the CCP, meaning that how loyal to the Chinese Communist Party. And I told you she is okay. What they call is very secular, very modern woman. Surya, uh, you can uh, go. To, I mean, later on you can go to the. Uh, I mean, Twitter. You can check her name is Rayhan Asad. Okay, Rayhan Asad. So I mean, she is very secular. Okay, secular and woman. Uh, no, I mean the wrong spelling. Uh, Rayhan, Rayhan T. Starting from T. Uh, no T T. Uh, Rayhan. No. Uh, A S A T. A A. As a T and R A, not A, R, R A. Yes, can you check this one? Yes, yes, exactly. And she is the one. Okay, she is the one, and uh, graduated from Howard Law of the School. I mean, she's graduated and she got and her master degree from Howard Law of the uh, Law of the School. Okay, so from actually she has a lot of touching stories as well. Okay, a lot of the touching stories as well. So what I want to say here is that his, her parents, sorry, how loyal to the Chinese Communist Party, okay, Chinese Communist Party, I mean, her, her brother, okay, uh, I mean, uh, jailed, okay, initially, they captured and her brother, but she was kept silent. She thought they will, the Chinese government will release and her brother, actually, but unfortunately, Okay, unfortunately, and she came to know that her brother is sentencing for 15 years jail. Okay, and uh, it is, she, maybe he is only like uh, 35 years old or maybe like 33 years old, actually quite young uh, entrepreneur, I mean, uh, in our city, actually. So the sister is secular, modern uh, lady, graduated from Howard Law of the School. The parents are very loyal to the Chinese Communist Party and so on and so forth. Even though they are very loyal family to Chinese Communist Party, unfortunately, and the brother, okay, brother, uh, I mean, the, the bring, being into that concentration camp. Uh, yes, she's the, that, that lady, actually. So now she's standing up with and her uh, brother, and she is now is become the activist. Initially, if, actually, initially, I push him to speak up uh, her brother, but she refused and she cut the relationship with me. No, I don't want to speak my, my brother. But now she becomes activist because of what? Because of, I mean, the pain and she relies from the Chinese Communist Party, actually. So what I want to tell you here, my brothers in Islam, uh, here, okay, so what they did the Chinese Communist Party, actually, uh, go to the first one, uh, ah, yes. So, 
uh, actually, you can read my story because I don't want to tell all of my story because there are many other speakers as well. So what they did, I can summarize some most important issues or the crisis against humanity. I was in Malaysia, I mean, uh, to advocating this Uyghur crisis, okay, Uyghur crisis, even one Chinese, I mean, Malaysian Chinese, and he is the head of the church association in Malaysia, even, even though he is a Chinese, and he admitted what's happening to the Uyghurs, the comprehensive attack or comprehensive genocide towards the Uyghurs. Even the non-Muslim, even though the Chinese origin, and he admitted the issues is, I mean, the genocide towards the Uyghurs. So what's happening, what, what happened actually, what happened and what's happening now? The first one is mass incarceration since the Holocaust based on the religion and ethnicity, okay? It is based on the Islam and based on the Uyghur. And brainwashing campaign that consider religion as mental illness to be cured. I mean, there is one of the journalists from Albania and the Chinese government has invited him to uh, visit the Chinese concentration camp, but Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, and he like exposed what happening there. And also he mentioned that is like brainwashing centers of the Uyghurs. One of the lady, her name is Aisha. And he asked him, are you Muslim? He said, no. She said, no, I'm not Muslim. I used to be Muslim, but I am now not Muslim. And the name is Aisha, but her answer was, she's not the Muslim. So you can, I mean, you can tell from there uh, what, what happening there, okay? So mass sentencing, you see, mass sentencing. Just now, so I mentioned my uncle's sentence for 15 years, 20 years, or like lifetime jail, actually, okay? Of the religious and the cultural figures. Initially, the Chinese government is denying there is no concentration camp. Okay, there is no such thing in, in no, they, they, they're telling, uh, we are lying to the world, there is no concentration camp. But they admitted, okay, later on they admitted, they have the, I mean, some re-education, so-called re-education center. Okay, but the professor of the universities, they I came to know, I came to know just uh, during the, this Kurban Eid al Adha, I have little bit chance to communicate with one of the men from our village. Actually, I come from the village. Are you able to perform Eid al Adha? And he told me, What are you talking about, brother? That is impossible. And even now, there is no single mosque in our village. I surprised. I mean, there are at least, at least uh, 40 to 50 masjid or the mosque in my village because my village is also quite big. Okay, there are 10,000 uh, Muslim population, around 10,000 Muslim population. But he told me, okay, all the mosque is being destroyed. This is actually first time I'm telling to the public. Okay, first time I'm telling to the public. I'm not... I mean, even I have the evidence and he wrote to me as well, but I don't want to because Chinese government, you know, and maybe they will do something for him, but I don't want to reveal his identity. So meaning that all the mosque is in being the demolished. Okay, so meaning that you can imagine all the ban of the Islamic practices, such as praying, of course, they collected all the Quran. Okay, all the Quran. I mean, they, they collected, and also there is no nikah. You just need to get a certificate from, I mean, just, just like what the non-Muslim they do, actually. Okay, there is no nikah. There is no janazah as well. If someone is passed away, they're not allowed to do any janazah. So we are praying 
I mean, here in Turkey, uh, we are paying, uh, I mean, Janaza, uh, I mean, Raib Namas, okay? We are doing Raib Salat for them, actually. Okay, so meaning that, of course, hijab is impossible. Just now you can see from my mother, my sister are forced to remove the hijab. And also uh, including like, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, you know, that is impossible. Uh, my sister is, when she's jumping into the water, I mean, she's that time, she may be like nine years old. And she said, Allahu Akbar. Then I posted in the way I posted actually, yeah. I posted in the WeChat. And someone say, you want to die? They don't know actually we are in our sis. Even saying Allahu Akbar is forbidden as well. So you can imagine, okay, what level the oppression of the Chinese government, okay? And also eradication of the Uyghur language from the education system. Now, uh, uh, I don't want to tell you also how I get the information. Now, even the small children forced to speak Chinese, they have to learn in the Chinese, I mean, the, of, co of course, when we small, uh, I mean, the Uyghur is main language, but we're learning Mandarin as well. Uh, I mean, as like additional language or like second language, actually. But now, fully implemented, meaning that they removed the Uyghur language. Actually, we are still using Jawi. I mean, we are still using Ara Ara Arabic alphabet for the Jawi. But I mean, the Jawi is removed from the, I mean, education system and also from public institutions. Okay, and also coercion of the Uyghur man into marriage with the Han Chinese man. So now I am 39 years old. Okay, until today, I never know anyone who is willing to marry with Han Chinese non Muslim. Okay, if it's a choice, they're not, I mean, they will not choose to marry with the Han Chinese. At least I don't know. Actually, I got education from just now, I told you one of the top universities in China. I was mixed with, I mean, the Han Chinese people, okay? But we never marry with the Han. But now, I mean, the Chinese government is, for example, they're giving incentive to the Han Chinese people, go to, I mean, a so-called Xinjiang or so-called East Turkestan, uh, sorry, a so-called Xinjiang or East Turkestan to marry with the Uyghur girl. Then they will give incentive to, to them, actually. Okay, they will give incentive to them. Uh, can you go back to Brazil, Surya? Uh, I'm almost like finishing because the other speakers also are waiting as well. Just go to that uh, my article. Uh, just let me uh, conclude, okay? And also systematic separation of the children from their parents. So all the parents is uh, what they call this being into the concentration camp, and they're also moving their children into the orphanage camp. Okay, and also there, they remove all Islamic values or the cultural values. Okay, all the cultural values. So they're forced to the Han Chinese identity. You may thought I'm exaggerating there, dear brothers and sisters. I told you, okay, uh, I mean, uh, whatever I said, I'm responsible. Okay, I mean, this, there is no single lie. Okay, and also creation of the human organ bank. Maybe you heard halal organ from China, for example. Where is the halal organ is coming from except the Uyghur people? Okay. And also transferring the hundreds of thousands of the Uyghurs into the other part of the China. So that, you know, uh, you know, uh, they, they become, I mean, the identity will be diminished or they're sending them into their long prison terms, actually. So meaning that if you go to the China, or if you go to so-called the Xinjiang or Turkestan, then you cannot see where, where is the prison. Oh, maybe we are keep lying. But they already transfer those people to the other part of the China. This is, I mean, the most dangerous part, actually. Okay? And also systematic destruction of the mosque. I think just now I also already mentioned on this. Okay? And also uh, restriction from inner city or like inter-neighborhood movement even before virus of course virus maybe you don't we do understand because of the virus they do some restriction but even before the virus i mean there was restriction the inner city the movement meaning that you cannot go to one city to do in other city okay and also the straying of the graveyard okay i mean uh like coercion of the muslim to the uh, cremation of the bodies instead of, of burial meaning that you have to do that uh, cremation rather than 
the burial of the body. Okay, and also a de facto communication blocked with the people with overseas. Okay, I didn't hear my parents' voice almost for three years. Actually, I got new son. I mean, just five months ago, even my mother didn't see. Not only my mother, my family or my relative, they didn't see see, see him. Even they didn't. I have three daughters. Actually, one son. I have four children. Four children never heard the voice of the. the I mean, uh, the, not only myself. Later on, maybe brother Fazil also can share his stories as well. Okay. So I mean, this is. I mean, what's happened? I mean, this is what I summarize systematically. Summarize what Chinese government they did for the Uyghurs. So you can see that this is comprehensive genocide in terms of religion, in terms of the culture, in terms of identity, and in terms of everything. So what we're asking from you, uh, can you just go down a little bit or finish? Uh, I, I thought uh, I already put something, what we're expecting from you, okay, well, from you, I mean, just before this, just before, uh, I think it's finished, but I mean, at least, just now as Brother Surya said, at least, I mean, some, uh, can you just go down a little bit? I want to mention one of the special cases as well. Uh, down, down, uh, up, up, sorry. Up, 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 sorry, up. Uh, you see this one? Uh, this, this one, you see the one on the right? Uh, the first one on the right is Mehmet Yakub. Now we don't know he's whether alive. I mean, uh, later on, uh, Surya, you can search Yakub Uluyol as no, uh, yeah, Yakub Uluyol. I mean, uh, Facebook. Maybe you can you can Yakub Uluyol, Yakub Uluyol Facebook, Yakub Uluyol. Ah uh, yes, the first one, Yakub Uluyol. Uh, he is my cousin. Okay, he is my cousin, and he is uh, one of the top students. Even uh, he came to Turkey. Uh, with, I mean, uh, the support from the Turkish government, he got the Turkish scholarship. Actually, the Turkish scholarship. Uh, not, 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 not this one. I think someone is taking his one. No, no, definitely not this one. Uh, yeah. Uh, you see the number three. Number. He's my cousin. Okay, he's my cousin. Also, he keeps silent for. Uh, two and a half years, actually, okay? To have, just go to down a little bit. Now, and also he started, because I push him, okay? I, I push him. You have to stand with your father. If you, you cannot stand with your father, how you can stand with our nation? Meaning that even you cannot stand with your parent, how come you stand with your nation? That is, I, uh, I, I push him now. Uh, I mean, he's become very, uh, uh, sorry, just, just keep Surya. The one just on the right, the one, the, the man, uh, I mean, uh, no, no, not this one. The, uh, I mean, ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. The one on the pointer, he's the one who translated the Quran. No, no, uh, sorry, not, uh, not, not, not this one, this one. I mean, the one, the small, small photos, the small, small photos. No, 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 I mean, on the, ah, uh, yes, 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 he's the one. He's the one who translated the Quran into the Uyghur language, okay? But he died in concentration camp, even though he is 83 years old, okay? So meaning that, what I want to tell here, okay? So this is not like story of one person or two person, okay? I mean, later on, you can listen to Brother Fazil's explanation as well. Now his brother, his father, I mean, the uh, Mehmet Yakub, okay? Also in the concentration camp. Can you go to, can you go to uh, just now the photo, my my one? Uh, yes. So uh, he is a, uh, he is the one on the right is Mehmet Yakub. The one is my auntie. Okay, uh, my auntie has and she has three uh, daughters and a three son. Two son is become paralyzed now. He actually his son is the champion of wrestling. I mean, he used to be many wrestling, I mean, because uh, the Turkish people, they love the wrestling. I mean, his son is used to be the champion of the wrestling, but now he's become paralyzed, paralyzed. 
I mean, after they've been into the concentration camp, he become paralyzed. And her husband sentenced into for 15 years. Okay, 15 years. And the, he, her, sorry, her, uh, I mean, because of the two son is being paralyzed, paralyzed, so that's why they released them. But the daughter's in law also sentenced into for 10 years just because of learning the Quran. The one in the middle is my, my mother. I sorry, the one in the middle is my father. Now, Alhamdulillah, he being released. The one, uh, the second from the left is Ahmad Yaqub. Okay, until today, he's missing. He's the one who is missing. Okay, so the one on the left is another uncle, is Yusuf Yaqub. And he also used to be sent for the concentration camp uh, because of the, our stand up with him and he being released as well, actually. Okay, so meaning that this is, I mean, how the Chinese government, not uh, actually why I tell my personal story. Actually, I documented my personal story so that later on the next generation also can see what happened to the Uyghur people as well. Okay, so with that, I would like to end my presentation. Later on, if any uh, uh, question Q&A, I'm ready to answer, okay? So with that, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Wa, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I feel very sad to hear your story. Uh, Thank you. Uh, brother uh, Burhan, Professor Burhan, yeah? I think the same thing also happened to my friend, Abdul Qayyum, who is a doctor actually, medical doctor, who remained uncontactable until now. We hope that uh, with a lot of effort by us and fellow Muslims around the world, we can do something about this. Let's proceed Inshallah. with, Inshallah Ta'ala. Let's proceed with Ahmad now. I'm going to mute you, uh, uh, Professor Burhan. Fazil, can you start your presentation? You can share your screen, I believe. I introduce Fazil just All now. All right. Okay, please. Okay, um, I'm actually using my phone right now, so sure, sure. Um, um, can let I, me. Uh, yeah, you. Oh yeah. You can. I can. I can share your presentation if you want. Um. You can. Okay. You can do it. Let too. me. Yeah, yeah. Let me try. Let me give it a try. Yeah, it's easy. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So while waiting, uh, I'm going to introduce, perhaps just now, Professor Burhan doesn't hear about Ahmad, yeah, about Fazil. He is actually a very, uh, a very smart person. Uh, he has a degree in literary journalism for his undergraduate, and afterwards he pursued law and passed the bar several years later. He actually is a practicing attorney. He has uh, uh, worked with uh, uh, and uh, perhaps a US law firm on immigration matters. So perhaps if uh, there are uh, Uyghur people who want to migrate to the United States, uh, Fazil would help. Uh, he's not here now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> never mind. Let me share while waiting for him. Uh, I'm allowing uh, multiple uh, participants. Fazil is Uyghur? He is not Fazil Uyghur. Fazil is Uyghur? He is not Uyghur, but, but he is a U.S. Uh, born Pakistani origin, uh, U.S. citizen of Pakistani origin and married an Indonesian and he lives, he resides in Yogyakarta now. But he often goes back to the United States as required, yeah? Uh, his time, uh, let me share his, I have, uh, let me share his uh, presentation, yeah? Uh, this is his presentation. Hello? Yeah, hello. Uh, maybe uh, maybe you can share my presentation and I'll I will, just... I will. Uh, don't worry, just... don't worry. 
Yeah, don't worry. I have prepared for the uh, for the uh, how do you? Okay. Sorry, I have prepared for it. So I'm going to use the. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, this presentation is titled uh, "Hope and Suffering in Xinjiang." I think Xinjiang is the Chinese name for Uyghur land. Yeah, East Turkestan, I believe, is the English name. <laughs> so, can you see this now, everyone? Or I'm only do okay. I haven't shared the screen. Let me share the screen. Yeah. Let me share the screen. Share screen. Okay. Can you see this now, everyone? Okay, Fazil, you can start. Okay, excellent. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, okay, uh, maybe we can move to the next slide. Uh, okay, um, so, uh, so first of all, it's an honor to be invited to this webinar. Um, so uh, today's presentation is going to be uh, non-academic. Um, I, I actually uh, prepared this presentation with an Indonesian um, audience in mind, um, based on my uh, based on my experience as an educator in Indonesia for the last six years. Uh, so I'm going to um, give a general overview of the situation in Xinjiang and uh, or East Turkestan and why we should care about it uh, through a profile of Bikamal Kaken, uh, who I've uh, written about in the past. And I'm also going to try to address some common misconceptions uh, which I've seen uh, repeated about this situation, especially in um, Indonesia. So that's uh, that's kind of an outline of this uh, presentation. I'm I'm actually a teacher, so this is a little bit uh, formal. Okay, excellent. So um, I want to start on a positive, uh, not a positive note. I want to start on a personal note um, and explain how I got involved in this um, in this cause. Uh, so as uh, Brother Surya mentioned. Um, uh, I'm not a Uyghur or uh, I'm not actually from the region. Um, actually, before 2017, I never even met uh, a Uyghur or a Kazakh or some, anyone from Central Asia. And um, so, um, but uh, since 2017, uh, this issue has really been front and center in my mind. Uh, it's something that's really dominated my thoughts. and. Um, try to do whatever I can to um, bring attention to it, as, as Brother Surya pointed out. Um, so let me explain why that is. Uh, so first of all, oh, actually, let's, uh, let's uh, go back to the previous slide. OK, so um, uh, Xinjiang slash East Turkestan, uh, it's a part of the world uh, which many people are not aware of, um, even in America or Indonesia. Um, Really, I think it's only recently that it's really been on the radar um, for most people. Uh, so for me, I was um, I was aware of the uh, human rights violations that were taking place uh, since you know the 2000s, early 2000s, but it was always on the periphery of of my mind. But after 2017, when I started reading about uh, China's crackdown in that region. Um, it really got my attention. And I think there are three reasons for that. Uh, number one is the sheer depravity of what's happening in uh, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Any, every human right abuse that you can think of is happening there. Uh, forced labor, um, concentration camps, torture, um, brainwashing, the separation of families, forced abortion, forced sterilization, um, and I mean it, the list goes on, uh, all with the with the clear aim of destroying uh, the culture and tradition of of a people. Uh, the closest parallel I can think of is actually the Spanish Inquisition, 
uh, which happened in the 1500s, uh, in which the Spanish crown, uh, using torture and imprisonment, uh, basically attempted to transform the uh, Islamic Arabic speaking population of uh, Spain or Al Andalus into uh, Catholic uh, Spaniards. Uh, so in this case, we have the same uh, we have the same situation. We have the Chinese uh, communist regime, which is doing everything it can using every technological um, ability it can muster to transform the people, the indigenous Turkic people of that region, uh, from being Turkic uh, Muslims into being uh, Mandarin-speaking uh, communist uh, robots. And uh, in addition to that, they're also trying to uh, reduce the population through these uh, forced um, birth control and forced uh, sterilization. So in that sense, they've even gone beyond the Spanish Inquisition because the Catholics were, were not into that. Uh, so that's, that's number one, the sheer depravity of the situation. And, uh, you know, for me as a Muslim, I mean, this really hit me very personally. I mean, because I could imagine uh, if that was me, I mean, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine because uh, the people in this region are being uh, are being persecuted for doing things that uh, that you and I, that uh, Muslims do on a regular basis, like entering a masjid or saying assalamu alaikum or things like that. Uh, number two, uh, what got my attention were the attempts of China to justify and hide what it's doing. Uh, so the Chinese attempts to justify uh, its campaign in uh, in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region are are comical. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, I believe the Chinese, uh, you know, one of the politicians uh, Hua Chunying, I think she's uh, responsible for uh, representing China's interests to the outside world. Uh, when you know when when America criticizes uh, China, she talks about the Native Americans like. You know, how can you criticize China when you Americans have, uh, you know, slaughtered uh, Native Americans 100 years ago? So, I mean, yeah. Um, and also attempts of hiding what it's doing. Obviously, um, China has, uh, well, for the first year in 2017, uh, China denied uh, that it was organizing uh, concentration camps. Uh, it has, up until today, it, it does not allow independent investigative uh, reporters or uh, human rights uh, investigations. Uh, it does not allow them free access into that region. And uh, it, it responds in a, a very childish way uh, whenever it's criticized. For example, uh, recently America has um, sanctioned uh, some individuals in in that region because of the human rights abuses. And what is China's response? China's response is to sanction people in America. So America is sanctioning China because of human rights violations. China is sanctioning America because America sanctioned them. So uh, it's hard to describe that in any way except uh, childish. So that kind of got my attention as well. And number three, of course, is the silence of the world. Uh, although I guess to be fair, uh, increasingly there is more condemnation uh, coming from, particularly from the free world, although from uh, Muslim majority countries, that's uh, not really the case. So I think these three uh, factors really stood out for me and made me decide that, gosh, it's really time to stand up and, you know, take a stand on this issue, raise awareness in whatever way that I can. Um, okay, uh, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so um, as Brother Surya pointed out, um, I am a uh, immigration attorney, uh, alhamdulillah. I did have the opportunity to work on the asylum case of a Uyghur uh, lady in 2000, uh, 2020, January 2020. Um, I can't really talk about her case because um, she's still, um, her case has actually been delayed because of all the COVID-19 delays. Um, but what I'd really like to talk about is 
my efforts in journalism. So basically, uh, by writing stories, uh, my goal is to tell stories on behalf of victims. If we want to know what is going on in uh, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, uh, we have to listen to people uh, such as Professor Burhan, such as uh, uh, the woman, uh, the lady that I'm going to talk about today. Um, we have to uh, listen to what uh, Uyghur, Kazakh people who have escaped from China are saying. Uh, very often, the defenders of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, they will show us pictures of Uyghurs uh, singing and dancing uh, in, the, uh, in Xinjiang and say, look, does this look like ethnic cleansing? Or, you know, sometimes they might ask us, uh, have you ever been there? Have you ever gone picnicking in Xinjiang? How do you know what you're talking about? And of course, that's ridiculous because Xinjiang, autonomous region, is one of the most heavily policed regions in the world. It's like North Korea. Uh, people are scared of talking to foreigners. People are afraid of uh, speaking their mind. So if we want to know what people, uh, what's really happening, we have to talk to people who are outside of China, uh, Kazakhstan, Turkey, Australia, those uh, refugees, those uh, asylum um, people who have attained asylum, and we need to listen to their stories. I wish that the Indonesian media would do more of that. Uh, instead of trying to visit uh, you know, China on some of these uh, uh, Chinese-sponsored uh, tours, it would probably be more beneficial to actually interview people uh, such as Professor Burhan. Um, all right, so um, Alhamdulillah, I've had the chance to uh, write two articles, um, ab uh, one about a Uyghur uh, man and a second about a Kazakh uh, woman. Uh, I have another, uh, actually, can we uh, go back to the previous slide? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, and so um, I have another interview tomorrow, and so I'm working on the third article, and I, I plan to uh, continue uh, this, this effort for, for as long as the nightmare in Xinjiang continues. Okay, so, um, so like I said, it's important for us to listen to these stories as a source of accurate information, you know, listening to people who can actually speak freely about what they experienced and what their family experienced. Uh, second, it's also important because it leads us to empathy. Uh, when we hear uh, the stories of people, uh, we realize that they're people just like us. Uh, they're not just, uh, we don't see them as people living in some faraway place. Uh, they're human beings with uh, emotions and hopes and aspirations, uh, just like all of us. And uh, so storytelling, uh, not story, uh, the telling of compelling stories is, uh, a pr is one way, one proven, historically proven way of leading to empathy. Um, and also on a practical level, uh, sometimes a story might be covered by the mainstream media, uh, but after that, it's no longer covered. But uh, sometimes these stories need to be continually brought up uh, so that something actually can get done. Uh, and so one example of that is uh, the uh, subject that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, her story has been covered in the past, but we need to keep doing it so that her uh, family members can be, uh, can be um, helped. Okay, and so uh, I actually get the contact information of these people from the Xinjiang Victims Database. Uh, Shahit.biz. Uh, the curator is Jean Bunin, and I will be referring to him uh, later uh, because this is an extremely invaluable source of information. Um, yeah, okay, so let's uh, go on to the next slide. Okay, so um, this is my latest uh, article on uh, Eurasia.net. Uh, so Eurasia.net is a uh, non-mainstream uh, source um, specializing in issues related to Central Asia. 
So uh, the woman in this picture is Bikamal Kaken, a Kazakh woman who fled China to save her unborn child, now fights to free her husband. All right, so Bikamal is uh, holding up a picture of her husband, Adil Ghazi Mukai, and right next to her is her uh, daughter. Um, she has three children. Okay, so um, Bikamal Kaken is a uh, Kazakh, and we'll talk a little bit about Kazakhs later. Uh, so she is from the um, autonomous region of Xinjiang. She was born there in a place called uh, Karamai, Karamai, which is a majority uh, Han Chinese area. Um, her husband was a uh, someone who worked in the oil uh, business. He worked in an oil factory, I, I believe an oil refinery. Uh, so he worked there for more than 20 years. Uh, B. Kamal was a housewife. She stayed home and took care of the couple's uh, two children, at that time two children, and, uh, and also the elderly mother of... Um, of uh, Mukai. Okay, so they had a pretty normal life, uh, but then, uh, but then things started to happen. So before I go into the details about B. Kamal, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the um, background of this situation. And uh, what I'm going to say, it might be very basic for um, for for anyone who's really uh, familiar with this issue, but. Um, but that's the way I um, I planned this because you know a lot of people, even educated people, are are unaware of you know even the basic facts of the situation. So I'm gonna uh, make this very non-academic, and you don't you don't have to be an academic to understand the uh, to understand what's happening. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, next slide. Okay, so. Um, so this is the place we're talking about in red. Uh, so as Brother Surya pointed out, Xinjiang is the um, Chinese name. It means new territory. And uh, it's what uh, the Chinese co uh, called it after they took over. Um, uh, another name is East Turkestan. So, um, so uh, this is East Turkestan. So West Turkestan would be the uh, Central Asian republics, um, Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, etc. So um, uh, I will I will call it Xinjiang just for convenience, but um, but yeah, it's basically a colonial name, but it refers to this autonomous uh, autonomous region. Okay, so uh, the vast, uh, the majority of people throughout history who have lived in this region are the Turkic uh, Muslim people, uh, particularly the Uyghurs, and that makes this province, uh, not a province, this autonomous region uh, very different from the rest of China. Uh, we can compare it to Tibet, which is um, under, uh, under Xinjiang. Uh, south of Xinjiang, uh, which is also home to a people who are ethnically distinct. Okay, so let's take a closer look. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so the ethnic groups of Xinjiang. So in 1945, uh, the uh, Uyghur homeland, because in 1945, I don't think it was called Xinjiang, but uh, the Uyghur homeland was 82.7% uh, Uyghur. Uh, today, Turkic uh, Muslims are only a slight majority. Uh, you can see that the Uyghur population has gone down from being 82% to being 45.84%. and. Uh, uh, there's a reason for that, but, uh, well, okay, so the reason is because uh, after after this uh, region was uh, taken over, uh, forcefully taken over by the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the Chinese uh, 
regime, it uh, encouraged Han Chinese to move in to the region in order to make the region uh, more Chinese, more culturally Han. So that's why today you have a, a population of about 40.48% Han. And uh, so, okay, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so here we have the Uyghurs. Um, these are Uyghurs. Uh, so the Uyghurs have traditionally been the uh, indigenous people of uh, what's now Xinjiang, indigenous, uh, that's a word, it means pre-Bumi, uh, the native people. Uh, so the native people are the uh, Uyghurs who are now, as we said, about 45% as a result of the um, the influx of Han Chinese people into uh, their homeland. Okay, uh, let's uh, move on to the next slide. All right, uh, so the uh, current day Xinjiang Autonomous Region is also home to the Kazakhs. Um, the Kazakhs are also a Turkic Muslim people, and they were also living in that region uh, before the, uh, the Chinese regime took over. Now, Bi Kamal, uh, the lady we're going to talk about, is actually a Kazakh, Kazakh. So she's not a Uyghur, but rather a Kazakh. So um, the Kazakhs are and Uyghurs are both Turkic Muslim, but they have a somewhat different culture, and also their language is different, even though it's related. Uh, kind of like Javanese and Sundanese are related, they're both Austronesian, uh, from the Austronesian family, but they're different languages that you can't really understand them, uh, each other. Okay, uh, perfect. Uh, oh, no, no, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so um, the Kazakhs and Uyghurs, uh, oh, and uh, just as a reminder, the Kazakhs are about 6% of uh, modern-day uh, Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Okay, now these people in, uh, these, uh, in this uh, slide um, are what we call Han Chinese. Uh, can we click the slide? I think we have a uh, title. Yeah, just click. Uh, there should be a title at the top. Yeah, that's right. So the Han Chinese are about 90% of China. And traditionally, as we said, the Han Chinese were a very small minority in what's now Xinjiang, but today they make up 40% of, of that region. So Han Chinese, these are the people that in Indonesia we call Orang Tiongkok, or maybe just Orang China. Uh, yes, so Jackie Chan or Ahok, the former uh, uh, governor of Jakarta, are those are both um, Han Chinese. So I thought I'd get that terminology uh, down before we continue. Um, uh, so the Han Chinese, they speak Mandarin, mostly. Uh, some of them speak Cantonese. Uh, and so, yes, they control the government or the regime of the uh, Chinese Communist uh, state. All right, let's uh, move on to the next uh, slide. Okay, so Bi Kamal, Bi Kamal Kaken. Her story really begins in the year 2016, uh, or maybe 2017. So let me just briefly summarize uh, what happens uh, between the 1950s. Uh, so remember, uh, the Uyghur homeland was uh, forcefully conquered, uh, taken over, uh, the Taklukkan, uh, by the uh, Chinese Communist Party in 1949. And since then, it has been part of the People's Republic of China. Okay, so from the 1950s until 2017, 
uh, we see a cycle of violence. Uh, many Uyghurs did not like uh, and do not like Chinese rule. There were protests and the Chinese respond with repression. Okay, so I want to take some time to talk about this because in Indonesia and in other parts of the world, and let me just say that Indonesian social media is flooded, dibanjiri, uh, with um, Chinese propaganda. And part of the propaganda that the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, the defenders of the Chinese communist regime used is that they say, well, China is just responding to a separatist threat, a separatist movement of radical Muslims, just like Indonesia, just like Indonesia in Aceh or Papua. So this is a common, uh, this is something common that I've heard even from educated people, uh, people who should know better. So I want to talk a little bit about the nature of Chinese uh, rule in the Uyghur homeland. So first of all, as most of us probably know, uh, China is a communist state. It is anti-religion. It does not like religion. Um, obviously, if you want to have any part in government in the, you know, the Chinese regime, you have to be an atheist. Um, so, and also it is dominated by the Han Chinese, uh, who are a, you know, who are a different ethnic group. So I want you to imagine, what would, you, what do you think would happen if the, if a communist government took over Indonesia? And uh, in school on Friday, uh, the students are not allowed to go to Friday Juma prayers. Instead, the students are forced to hold hands and swear an oath, bersumpa, that they will never uh, attend Friday prayers. They will never fast during Ramadan. Um, I think some Indonesians would probably, you know, maybe some people would just go along with it, but I think some people would be very upset. And, uh, or how, what do you think would happen if, in this uh, imagine if in this scenario uh, in Indonesia you had neighborhood patrols that went around and uh, if they see a woman wearing a headscarf they they stop her and say you have to take off that headscarf um, or uh, well all of those things are happening in Xinjiang uh, the autonomous region so. I think it's very understandable and almost expected that people would be upset and hostile towards Chinese rule, considering that they do exactly that. So, but, uh, okay, so to return to a personal note, um, actually, never mind. Uh, so that would be my uh, response to people who say that the Chinese uh, state is, uh, I mean, if they're responding to a separatist threat, it's probably something they've created themselves through their repressive rule. And by the way, both of those things I mentioned, I've actually heard firsthand uh, from the two people whom I've interviewed. And it's well documented. It's well documented how uh, even, you know, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, Uyghurs are not allowed to uh, fast, you know, especially students, teachers. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hard to see how that would uh, make anyone happy with Chinese rule. Okay, so um, then from 2017 until the present, uh, now we have the uh, cultural genocide that's going on. Okay, so at this point, uh, let's uh, let's segue into B. Kamal's story. Uh, let's uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so B. Kamal Kaken. So, uh, and by the way, B. Kamal Kaken is actually the woman I was talking about who um, uh, the neighborhood patrol uh, approached her and told her to take off her headscarf. So that was B. Kamal. But of course, I mean, this has happened all over uh, this, this region. Uh, she just represents that. 
Okay, so um, in 2016, uh, the neighborhood patrol was uh, coming uh, around and uh, and uh, they were, you know, doing things like, you know, preventing the women from wearing headscarf, preventing them from doing things which were, you know, seen by the, the Chinese regime as being inappropriate. Uh, but then they started to hear rumors that um, the... Uh, Kazakh and Uyghur uh, women were being forced to have abortions. Now, this made B. Kamal very disturbed because she was pregnant at the time with her third child. And, uh, you know, she was afraid. And now, of course, uh, very recently, uh, two, uh, I believe it was, all, you know, almost a month ago, there was a report from the Associated Press uh, which uh, shows that it was actually a uh, organized government policy to implement um, forced abortion, forced sterilization uh, in the uh, Uyghur, Kazakh, and other Muslim populations uh, in order to reduce their numbers. Uh, so this was a government plan, and it worked, because from 2015 until 2018, uh, it can be seen that the Uyghur population, uh, the growth rate, rather, uh, dropped very sharply. So, um, so Bikamal did not want uh, to lose her unborn child. So she and her family, her husband, uh, decided to move to Kazakhstan. Uh, so it's very easy for ethnic Kazakhs, uh, whether they're in China or Mongolia or Russia, it's very easy for them to move and get permanent citizenship in Kazakhstan. And so that's what they did. Uh, so the husband, Mukai, he retired from his job. Uh, he was sick and receiving uh, retirement, or in Indonesian, pensiun. pensiun. Uh, so they moved to Kazakhstan, and they began a new life there in 2017, I believe. May have been 2016. I, my memory escapes me. Okay, um, in 2017, Mukai, the husband, received a phone call from his work, the oil company in Karamai, and it told it uh, he was told that he had to attend a work meeting, and uh, he was told if he did not attend this work meeting, his pen his pension pension would be cut off. So the pension was the only source of money that the family had, and they had three children at this point. So their third child, Alhamdulillah, was born, was not, you know, forcefully aborted in China. Uh, so he went back uh, to, uh, to um, China for this meeting. And now in the summer of 2017, this was before uh, people knew about the mass detentions and the concentration camps. So Mukai didn't, you know, he didn't fear anything. Uh, in fact, he had visited China previously after moving to Kazakhstan. Uh, what he was worried about was his pension. Okay, that's what he was thinking about. But as it turned out, um, uh, he was actually arrested immediately upon entering the Chinese border, crossing the Chinese border, and he was put in a concentration camp. And since then, B. Kamal has not heard anything from her husband. I mean, no, no, no. She has not heard her husband's voice or seen him for the last, uh, I guess, three years, maybe a little bit more. Uh, she did receive some news of him from. Uh, in-laws in China, because at one point he was allowed to make a phone call uh, to his family. So B. Kamal, uh, alone in Kazakhstan with her three young children, uh, she did whatever she could do. She talked to whoever would listen. Um, and uh, so she actually gave an interview to a German journalist. Uh, named Ben Mrock, in which she described her situation. And uh, this journalist wrote an article about her story and also other stories of, you know, Uyghurs and Kazakhs and 
uh, you know, Kyrgyz and others uh, living in Central Asia who had escaped uh, from, from China. Now, uh, this article actually caught the attention of the Chinese ambassador in Kazakhstan. And uh, he actually gave an interview to the Global Times, which is the Chinese communist newspaper, in which he basically, he accused the article of being propaganda from America, from the US. So he claimed that these stories were made up by America. In fact, I believe the first sentence, uh, it was something like, it's an old trick for the US to use amateur actors to play the victim or to play victims. So uh, this Chinese ambassador uh, accused B. Kamal of being an amateur actor. So, and yet, at the same time, he also specified, he also clarified that the husband was in fact sentenced to nine years in prison. So after the concentration camps, you know, from 2017 to 2019, he was sentenced to prison for quote unquote, disturbing public order. So on one hand, the ambassador is calling the Kamal an amateur actor, but on the other hand, he's, saying, uh, there, he's also saying, yeah, we also sentenced her husband to prison. So it's one of those paradoxes you don't really understand unless you've had some you know, Chinese communist brainwashing. Um, so uh, this was actually the first news that B. Kamal had of her husband uh, from the Chinese government. She had sent them petitions uh, you know, for, for years and never received any reply. But after she gave that um, interview, uh, then finally she learned uh, what happened to her husband. And uh, okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, lessons from Bikamal's story. There are quite a few lessons we can learn. Number one, China's persecution in uh, the Uyghur homeland uh, not only applies to Uyghurs, but all of the Muslim, uh, especially Turkic peoples of Xinjiang. Uh, in fact, I would say, a, even though Kazakhs are only 6% of, uh, of, the, of, this, of the region, I would say that probably disproportionately we have more testimonies from Kazakhs. A lot of what we know um, about the nature of the concentration camps uh, comes from Kazakh uh, testimonials. And part of that is because a lot of them have relatives in Kazakhstan who, um, who, who push the government to, you know, to intervene, uh, even though the Kazakh government is very pro-China. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, this is a full-on attack against the indigenous pre-Bumi uh, Muslim peoples of Xinjiang. Uh, the Chinese, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, so uh, going on. Number two, so the husband was charged with uh, terrorism or spreading terrorist ideology and uh, disturbing public order. Uh, so this is a very common uh, accusation which leads to uh, many years in prison and it is often applied to people who do things which are not criminal I, I mean which would not be considered not be considered criminal by normal people uh, so for example these are just two examples out of thousands um, there was a Uyghur man who told his co-workers uh, not to watch pornography. Uh, he told them uh, not to use bad language. Uh, he told them not. Uh, he told them that they should pray before eating, and because of that, he was sentenced to ten years in prison. Prison, yes, not uh, concentration camp, but prison. And uh, you can actually look him up. He's entry six seven eight four on shahit.biz. Uh, you can see the court statement. Uh, ten years. So. This, uh, his giving advice to his coworkers was considered disturbing public order. Uh, there was 
a woman who removed her headscarf for a, oh, sorry, this is wrong, did not remove her headscarf for a flag salute. So we know that uh, the autonomous uh, region of Xinjiang is full of concentration camps, but the reality is the entire region is a concentration camp because it's full of surveillance. Um, just as you have brainwashing in the concentration camp, there's also brainwashing outside of the concentration camps. So for example, uh, people have to attend these massive flag salutes in which they have to stand up and uh, you know, uh, give their allegiance to the flag of communist China. So there was a woman, uh, I believe she was also a Kazakh. Uh, she did not remove her headscarf uh, for the flag salute. And as a result, she was sentenced to 19 years in prison. And this was a middle-aged woman, probably you know, 50. So uh, this sentence is basically a death sentence. She's entry 2135 on shahit.biz. And actually her reason for not removing her headscarf is actually she had had surgery that day. So she needed to cover her head, but uh, that didn't matter. So, um, so the point is, uh, charges, so if uh, the Chinese say that they're fighting terrorism, well, this is what they consider terrorism. I think uh, most of us who are listening to this webinar would probably be considered terrorists, according to communist China. Okay, another point is the release, quote unquote, release of detainees. So periodically, the Chinese regime claims that it has released uh, the detainees, I think in September or uh, you know, sometime in late 2019, they said that they had released all of the uh, people in the concentration camps. Well, the truth is, uh, so that's, you know, that's very difficult to verify, but we can see from uh, the story of Bikamal's husband but yes, he was released from the concentration camp, but he was released into prison. Prison. Um, the person whom I'm interviewing tomorrow, uh, he is also a Kazakh. Uh, his wife is trapped in, in Xinjiang. She is actually, uh, she was in a concentration camp, but uh, she had to have some surgery and now she is under house arrest. You know, she's not allowed to leave her town. Uh, she's followed by the neighborhood patrol. Um, so yeah, so, so even if people are released from concentration camps, they might still be under house arrest. They might be in prison. They might be in forced labor. In China, all prisoners have to do forced labor. So they might be doing forced labor in prison. OK, so that's an important point there. Finally, American propaganda. OK, perfect, perfect. Uh, can we go? Uh, can we go back? Yes, still, still talking about lessons from B. Kamal. Okay, so hopefully all of that got recorded. Uh, if not, I can can repeat. Okay, so American propaganda. So, um, yes. Yeah, so this article about B. Kamal, uh, previous to to my article, uh, this uh, that was written by a journalist who was based in Germany who has no ties whatsoever to the U.S. government, but the Chinese ambassador said immediately, American propaganda. This is a trick by the American government to, um, you know, to use these amateur actors to make China look bad. So basically, uh, the uh, Chinese ambassador to Kazakhstan is basically a liar. That's the only way we can put it. A liar. Pumbohong, Pundusta. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this journalist traveled probably for months around Central Asia, talking to people, uh, you know, writing their stories down. And this Chinese ambassador just dismisses it with one word, American propaganda. 
Now, I just want to make one point, and that is I understand that this is uh, what the Chinese regime does. Uh, what, the, uh, what this ambassador did is very characteristic of the Chinese communist regime. Uh, so in 2017, they lied to the UN about the existence of the concentration camps. Uh, they claimed that there were no concentration camps. Uh, beginning in 2018, they changed their lie and said, no, they're not really concentration camps. They are re-education centers. And uh, so that should not surprise us uh, because the Chinese communist regime is not bound by any kind of moral law. For them, uh, lying is not, I mean, it's not a sin. But I do get very, uh, it's very unfortunate to me when uh, Muslims, even leaders of Muslim organizations or figures of Muslim organizations, repeat um, the Chinese line that the human rights abuses in Xinjiang are American propaganda. I find that very, uh, very unfortunate and very, um, uh, they're basically slandering, slandering, uh, backbiting uh, their brothers and sisters, such as B. Kamal, who have uh, taken the, the courage to tell the world their stories. So uh, yeah, I thought I'd like to point that out. Okay, uh, finally, well, not finally, but second to last, uh, this shows us the irrational nature of Chinese policies in the region. What possible goal could the Chinese regime have of locking up Mukai for nine years? I mean, yeah, what, what possible uh, reason could they have for locking up a 50-year-old retired man in ill health who doesn't even live in China anymore? Yeah, it's hard to answer that. But of course, we could ask the same question. What's the point of sentencing a 50-year-old woman to 19 years in prison for not removing her headscarf? What's the point of having, uh, what's the point of forcing people not to fast during Ramadan? What's the point of locking up hundreds of thousands of people in concentration camps is not going to make them love china um yeah so this uh so her story is evidence if we need any evidence of the irrational nature of chinese policies in the region uh how can we help so uh as i was listening to b kamal something occurred to me naturally so B. Kamal is a single mother raising three children in a foreign country. She doesn't have any income because uh, all of her income was from her husband, and now her husband is gone. So uh, something we can do to help is financially supporting people like B. Kamal. Uh, so if you look at my article, I link to Atajurt, which is um, an organization that... Uh, you know, does things like this. Uh, there's others, uh, Gene Boonin, who I mentioned in the beginning, he sometimes does fundraisers, and I'm sure there's many other avenues we can, we can find uh, to help, uh, you know, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other victims of Chinese repression, you know, help them get on with their life. Some of them not only have financial issues, a lot of them have medical issues, a lot of them have psychological issues. Okay, so those are some lessons from B. Kamal's story. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is a slide that I think is very important uh, from an Indonesian perspective. Um, uh, so uh, this issue of you know what's happening in the Uyghur homeland, this became very viral in Indonesia. Um, around uh, December 2019. A part of it was because of a Wall Street Journal uh, article in which the title was, you know, how China silenced the Muslim, uh, the, the largest Muslim majority country in the world. Uh, so there were a lot of articles um, published, a lot of opinion pieces. And, uh, you know, I was impressed. There was a, a massive protest in Jakarta. Well, I don't know how massive. I mean, everything in Indonesia kind of 
seems massive. But, um, but unfortunately, there were some, uh, okay, to backtrack, most of the articles you'll find in Indonesian about this issue are actually translations of, um, of Western articles, uh, translations or summaries or simplifications. But occasionally, I, uh, I did see, uh, you know, an author, a journalist, or, uh, you know, Chandiyak Kawan, who tried to, uh, you know, use their, use their mind and, and come up with uh, some original thoughts. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them kind of um, committed the same fallacy that I mentioned earlier, which is comparing uh, the situation in China to the situation in Papua. And I guess that's understandable because as people, we tend to uh, we tend to see things that are far away in light of things which are familiar. And uh, some of, a lot of them, you know, accepted the Chinese line that uh, this whole, this whole, uh, you know, news about human rights abuses is just, you know, propaganda barat or, you know, Western propaganda or American propaganda. Uh, one of them even said that American, uh, you know, Western media is not able to see both sides of the story. You know, there are two sides to every story. Okay, so I want to talk about that because I think that's very relevant. You know, in social media, you can still find uh, people discussing in Indonesia, Indonesian, uh, whether or not there are actually human rights violations taking place. All right, so two sides to every story. Uh, side A says there are massive human rights violations happening in Xinjiang, uh, even to the point of ethnic cleansing, some would say genocide. And then there's point B, there is side B, which is everything is fine, bike, bike, saja. Uh, the Muslims in Xinjiang are the happiest Muslims in the world, uh, which is you know an actual quote from the Chinese communist uh, media. Uh, maybe it was the Global Times. Yeah, the happiest Muslims in the world. Everyone's fine. It's like Disneyland. Um, so let's take a look at the evidence and who is saying uh, who supports what. Uh, can we go back to the uh, previous slide? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we have the Western media, and I put Western in quotation marks. I don't actually like that term because, you know, Western, you know, Western countries are very diverse. Uh, they have different political interests. Uh, but in Indonesia, people talk about, you know, media barat, so I'm using that. So um, if Western countries like America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Germany, France, the UK, if they have anything in common, it's the fact that first, they are democracies, uh, they have freedom of speech, second, freedom of press. Uh, and that's quite different from the Chinese media, which is non-independent. The Chinese media says whatever the Chinese regime uh, says. Otherwise, uh, the journalists will, you know, disappear. As, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, so I would trust, uh, so if anyone tells you that, uh, you know, we shouldn't trust Western propaganda. Well, the question is, why should we trust Chinese propaganda when their media is not independent? Okay, so where does the Western media get these stories? Do they just, you know, well, let's see. Based on testimony from victims, such as Bikamal, such as uh, people who have been victimized, uh, people who have escaped, and again, uh, when it's very unfortunate when uh, people who are associated with Muslim organizations um, attack the quote unquote Western media and say that it's biased because they're basically slandering the uh, their brothers and sisters who have, you know, who have risked their lives in many cases or risked their relatives' lives to tell their story. Yeah, I really wish they would understand what they were doing. Uh, and in addition to testimony from victims, we have satellite images which show the destruction of mosques and uh, 
uh, tombs and also the building of concentration camps. And we also have Chinese government documents. So uh, the Western media supports side A. Uh, okay, global, quote unquote, Western media. Uh, global Human Rights Organizations, uh, UN or PBB in Indonesian, uh, Human Rights Watch. I have yet to see any human rights, via, uh, human rights organization that does not take position A. Uh, we have academics. So uh, for many people, uh, 2017 was the first time they heard of Xinjiang or the Uyghurs or you know, et cetera, but academics who have studied the region for decades, Brian Thumb, uh, Darren Byler, James Millward, et cetera, many of them have now become activists because they understand what's going on. So, um, so that, uh, those are the supporters of side A. Okay, side B, supported by the Chinese regime. So uh, the Chinese regime, which denied uh, the existence of the camps in 2018, no, 2017, uh, which limits access, does not allow free access to, um, uh, to the region, even to journalists, much less to, um, uh, much less to uh, human rights investigation. And of course, the Chinese media, you know, we say whatever the Chinese regime says. So yeah, there's two sides to every story, but if we, if we care, and I think that's the point, if we actually have empathy, it's not really hard to see which side is reliable, trustworthy, and which side is an opportunistic lie. Okay, um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, another point I want to uh, bring up, and this is also uh, for the purpose of correcting a misconception. Uh, there is another population of Muslims in the People's Republic of China called the Hui. Now, the Hui, the, the majority of the Hui do not live in uh, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Uh, they live in other parts of China. So sometimes uh, the, well, first of all, the Chinese government uh, uses uh, that fact to, uh, you know, to refute uh, human rights violations in Xinjiang. For example, in 2018, I believe, uh, the Chinese em uh, embassy in Indonesia actually uh, put pictures of this, uh, of this nature, such as this, of Hui people uh, practicing Islam, you know, doing Islamic activities, as if to say, look, we're not, we're not persecuting Muslims. Look at these Muslims here. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, people, people often, uh, you know, people who are not familiar with what's going on, they might take that seriously. Uh, I actually watched a program in which a, a diplomat in Indonesia, you know, he was being questioned about the Uyghur situation, and you know, he uh, he seemed kind of confused, and he was like, um, "Oh yeah, we have to really look into this. You know, we have to find out what's happening. You know, karena ya saya udah ke Beijing, udah ke masjid, semua aman aman saja. You know, I I was in Beijing, I I visited a mosque, and everything looked fine. So uh, this is a point that uh, people uh, people make." And uh, let's actually, uh, so I, I guess I should mention the Hui are sometimes called Han Muslims. Uh, the Hui are basically Mandarin speaking uh, people who practice Islam, uh, who live all over China, but especially in the Northwest. Okay, so the situation with the Hui is somewhat different. However, there is a detail we need to point out, and let's move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, and can we click one more time? Okay, sorry, sorry, let's, uh, let's go back. <laughs> okay, I must have taken off my markup. Okay, so 
Uh, if we remember from the uh, ethnic breakdown, the Hui are about 5% of Xinjiang. Now, Hui people who live in Xinjiang have been put in concentration camps also. Um, there is an article about that by Jean Bunin. Uh, there was a Hui girl from California. Uh, she visited her father in uh, Xinjiang, and she was detained for six months in a police station after she tried to um, check her Gmail account using a VPN. So Hui who live in Xinjiang are also subject to the same possibility of being put into internment camps, and I'm sure they face the same uh, religious restrictions. However, it is true that the Hui in other parts of China are not yet the victims of ethnic cleansing, and that's for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, the Hui are, they look like Han Chinese and they speak Mandarin, so they are often not identifiable by people, by the, you know, by people. So they don't face the same racism that the Turkic people in uh, the Uyghur homeland face. They also don't face the same economic discrimination. And for that reason, they are not, um, not seen as a threat. Uh, can we, uh, I can't see these slides. Can we, uh, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, So uh, comparing the Hui to the Uyghurs is actually not accurate. It's more accurate to compare the uh, Turkic peoples of, of this region to the Tibetans, uh, the Tibetans who are also uh, religiously and uh, linguistically distinct from the uh, Han Chinese. Okay, uh, there are reports of Hui um, facing, you know, restrictions on their religious life. Uh, for example, uh, many mosques and Islamic schools have been closed or uh, etc. So if the uh, Chinese government can can do what it's doing in you know to the Turkic peoples, the Hui may well be the next target. Many Hui actually have that fear. And uh, so I believe that by speaking out and spreading awareness about what's happening in Xinjiang, I believe that we can, you know, prevent the Chinese state from expanding its, uh, its campaign against the non-Han people. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I can't see the slide. I'm seeing an email. Okay, yeah, so next. Okay, and to further drive a, uh, to further drive a nail into the coffin of anyone who says that the Chinese Communist Party is fighting against uh, terrorism or separatism, uh, these are some of the people who have been, who have been detained who have disappeared or have been murdered. And I actually shared this with my uh, class. Um, and I would, if you're watching this and you're an educator, I would encourage you to, um, you know, have your students um, research these people. You know, maybe have this like, a, you know, make this an assignment, a presentation, some of these people. Um, we have Rahil Dawood. Uh, internationally famous anthropologist from uh, who studied the Uyghur culture, visiting scholar at UC Berkeley, one of the greatest universities in the world. She went missing in, you know, at the height of this crackdown. Uh, her whereabouts are completely unknown. Uh, Abla John, the Uyghur Michael Jackson. Um, so uh, Muhammad Saleh Hajim, who uh, Brother uh, Burhan also mentioned, uh, he's the one who translated the Quran into Uyghur. Uh, he actually died in custody in early 2018. And uh, when I assigned this to my students, I would say about 30% of them, so I gave them these uh, names and I told them they could choose other people to do a video profile. Um, yeah, do, do a video profile of these, you know, if you feel comfortable, put it online, put it on social media. 
I would say about 30% of them chose Muhammad Saleh Hajim, or yeah, Hajim, uh, because, you know, I teach at an Islamic institution, so I think that, you know, as Muslims, they probably felt, uh, you know, they realized this could be, this could be like our teacher, you know, if, if we were in that situation. Um, so, okay, and then we have Ilham Tukti, uh, very famous. Uh, and then, of course, we have people, uh, these two at the bottom, who became famous after uh, they were detained. Uh, Sayra Gul Saudbai, honored as a woman of courage in the U.S. So, um, so uh, stories, you know, stories about people, that's what is compelling, that's what gets people's attention. If anyone says that... Uh, China is fighting a war against separatism. Well, these people, I mean, what, what is the reason for their detention or murder? Uh, it's kind of, I, I think this is something, along with the testimonies in general, but especially this, this is something that defenders of Chinese communist China, uh, when you bring this up, they just have to shut up because they have no answer. Uh, this shows clearly that China is trying to destroy a culture and a, a, tr a people. It's not trying to fight uh, separatism. It's yeah. Okay. Um, let's uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the internet is also uh, full of people who say, um, you know, every country has the right to do what it wants. You know, jangan ikut campur, don't get involved in other countries, you know, worry about your own country, worry about Papua, etc. Well, for all of those people, I would ask them this question. If your government took away your passport, locked you and your family up without a trial, and tortured you, all because of your ethnicity or religion, wouldn't you want people in other countries to speak out? Uh, wouldn't you want someone to stand up for you? Or would you want them to say, oh, well, it's another country, uh, you, know, you can deal with it. Obviously, this is a rhetorical question. I don't think anyone would say no. Uh, so, but this is a perfect response to anyone who says, you know, why should we, why should we care? Well, you know, treat your brother as you would want them to treat you. Okay, basic humanity, let's move on to the next slide. Um, okay, and one more. I think we have another picture. Okay, perfect. Okay, so besides basic, uh, basic humanity, it's very important for uh, Muslims uh, to show solidarity with our brothers and sisters in uh, the Uyghur homeland. And many of them do. Uh, here we see some Indonesians. Uh, at the bottom, we see some Indians. And uh, yes, uh, because as my students uh, said, many of them in their presentation, this could be us. If we were there, this could easily be us uh, who are suffering because they're suffering for the same things that, that we do, uh, such as uh, saying assalamu alaikum or, or uh, you know, praying in a mosque or, uh, you know, et cetera. Okay, next slide. And, uh, and another thing, you know, particularly Indonesia, I believe Indonesia values different cultures, you know, uh, it's one of the foundations of, of the Indonesian nation, you know, every, every ethnic group is allowed to maintain their own culture. So if we care about culture, we should oppose what is, you know, the Chinese policies in the Uyghur homeland, uh, because a unique culture is being destroyed. Uh, uh, one more click. Okay, uh, here we have uh, makams, uh, just like in Indonesia, we have the Wali Songo. I mean, how would we feel if the communists, not only are they, not only are they forcing uh, people not to practice religion, but they're also destroying the makams, the places where people do ziara, uh, yeah, how would we feel? Would we support that? Would we say, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great way to fight uh, separatism. That's exactly what we're doing in, you know, uh, I, I don't think so. I think if we value cultural diversity, we have to stand up 
against what China is doing uh, in the Uyghur homeland. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, and this is something I uh, came to uh, know about recently. So, um, so let me just point out, uh, you know, China is waging a war against the Turkic Muslim cultures in, uh, as this says, East Turkestan or Xinjiang, as the Chinese uh, call it. Uh, it's not only religious people who are being targeted. Basically, any, I mean, anyone who's had contact with the outside world, anyone who has any, uh, you know, interest in the Uyghur culture, people who just, uh, you know, having what's up on their phone. But one population which really has been affected disproportionately is religious people, imams, and also students who have come back from places like Al-Azhar University. So I, uh, you know, I decided to share this picture because Al-Azhar University is a place where many Indonesians go to study. At the institution I teach at, we have many graduates from Al-Azhar. Uh, usually when people go to Al-Azhar, you know, they get their education, they learn, they come back and they hope to become leaders or imams or people that the community looks up to. Well, imagine coming back from Al-Azhar University to your homeland, imagine being detained, arrested, tortured, and then sentenced to, I believe, 14 years in prison. I might have the number uh, incorrect, uh, but you can actually look this up on uh, shahit.biz, entry 5340. Yes, this could indeed be, uh, this happens to be a Kazakh uh, family. Uh, the, the man, uh, Baghdad Hakin, is the one who is currently in prison. But yeah, just uh, just blink and this could be someone from Jogja. So it's not something we can ignore. Uh, all right, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, and this, oh. this is our final slide. Uh, let's click one more time. Okay, the importance of telling stories. It is important for, uh, for us to listen to the stories that are told by uh, Uyghurs and Kazakhs, uh, people such as Professor Burhan, people such as uh, Bikamal Kaken, uh, it's important for us to listen to their story. Uh, first, not only, first of all, to know what's happening uh, beyond the uh, Chinese propaganda, and also for us to realize, as we said in the beginning, uh, storytelling, uh, you know, hearing stories is a way of developing empathy. We realize, especially as Muslims, we uh, realize how close these people are to us and uh, how we could be in a similar situation. Uh, I mentioned that storytelling is um, ha has been historically proven to create empathy. Uh, one example I can very quickly cite is the most influential book in American history, which is Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, that was a book written by Harriet Beecher Stowe at a time when America was torn apart, being torn apart literally by the issue of slavery. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, it, it showed the suffering that the uh, black slaves were going through, and it showed them as human beings, uh, you know, with their, you know, their own aspirations, their hopes, their emotions. Uh, and, you know, I, I read the book recently. I've, over this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I've been trying to brush up on American literature. And often Harriet Beecher Stowe, she directly addresses the audience and says, you know, you're a human being. These are human beings. How can you allow this injustice of slavery to go on in your country a few miles away in the South, in some cases, a few miles away? And her book changed public opinion uh, more than information ever could have. Uh, the Northerners knew that slavery existed. Uh, when Abraham Lincoln uh, met her after the Civil War, recognized, you know, the impact that her book had. So, um, so in our, in this 21st century, what we're witnessing is a modern day 
Inquisition, a modern day, uh, we can even say Holocaust. In a, um, uh, so the least we can do is try to raise awareness in the, uh, in the spirit of uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe and uh, in accordance with the teachings of our religion in which all believers are brothers. I hope we can, I hope uh, all of you listening can, can do your part, can do whatever you can to bring attention to this uh, massive nightmare which is happening in the Uyghur homeland. And with that, I will end. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Fazil. Although it seems that I'm checking something else here, I'm actually uh, checking out all the information that Fazil has included in his uh, presentation. Jin Bunin and a lot of information I have checked out and I will share with you in the video YouTube description later what I have found. And last but not least, we have our final presenter today, Mr. Saibul Antofiregar. Where is he? Is he? Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. I'm can here. You, can you share your can video? You? Okay. Uh, brother Surya, so, I didn't pray Asar yet. Can I pray the Asar first? Yeah. Go ahead. You can rejoin us later. Don't switch off the video yet. Okay. Can, can you hear my voice? Can you hear me? Okay. I want to start my presentation with appreciate to Mr. Professor Burhan with uh, some pengakuan, yeah. I personally feel very guilty for not keeping adequate attention to our Uyghur and Xinjiang Muslim brother suffering. So, pertama, uh, to Professor Fadil, I agree with you that all media didn't want to expose fully, honestly, and openly about this suffering. That's why it's very difficult to take some decision or something to do. The next, let me express myself in Indonesia. Can you see my file? Yeah, okay. I start with this. Saya ingin membandingkan beberapa tempat di dunia yang memiliki penduduk dengan identitas mayoritas dan bagaimana mereka berbeda di dalam memperlakukan minoritas mereka sepanjang waktu Indonesia sewaktu dimerdekakan memiliki hampir 99% beragama Islam dan sekarang untuk 75 tahun setelah kemerdekaannya tersisa 87% full screen full screen oke is ya 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 Ya. Sedangkan di Cina saya melihat data 73,56% adalah penduduk dengan agama lokal. Islam di situ hanya 0, sekian persen. Mengapa ada perbedaan situasi yang dihadapi oleh minoritas di seluruh dunia khususnya di dua tempat Indonesia 
dan Cina. Pak Fajil sangat tahu bahwa di Indonesia itu isu-isu pluralisme dan terorisme itu ditujukan kepada umat Islam sebagai mayoritas. Ini sesuatu yang aneh di dunia dan ini konspirasi internasional. Mungkin sejak pemboman di Menara Kembar itu dan teori-teori yang dikembangkan tentang uh, pertempuran antar peradaban terus memandu permusuhan terhadap dunia Islam termasuk di Indonesia dan apa yang terjadi di Cina seolah-olah dianggap sah untuk karakter yang gelap yang jelek yang digambarkan oleh media selama ini perbedaan kondisi di dua tempat itu saya ada beberapa pertama karakteristik dari agama yang dianut oleh mayoritas itu inherent di dalam agama itu ada sebuah sikap permusuhan ya saya kira seluruh agama menginginkan bahwa sebuah pengakuan sebagai agama terbenar di antara agama-agama yang ada adalah sesuatu yang alamiah dan seluruh agama memiliki sifat-sifat misionaristik yang terkadang mendorong pemeluk-pemeluknya untuk melakukan berbagai hal rasa kecemasan selalu timbul pada mayoritas di Cina maupun di Indonesia ketika ada tanda-tanda kebangkitan dari unsur-unsur kelompok minoritas apalagi itu terkait dengan agama lalu kemudian karakter itu diikuti oleh state police walaupun tidak diakui secara terus terang tapi hampir seluruh dunia memiliki agama yang dianggap menjadi seakan-akan atau seolah-olah menjadi agama negara. Ada yang secara terang-terangan seperti Malaysia mengklaim diri sebagai negara dengan agama resmi Islam. Indonesia negara sekuler tapi ada pengakuan-pengakuan tertentu yang menunjukkan kepemihakan mereka terhadap agama. Di beberapa, negara, di beberapa negara bagian di Amerika, saya juga melihat intervensi negara terhadap agama dalam bentuk supporting funding pada gereja. Walaupun mereka tidak mengatakan seperti itu. Negara-negara di Eropa juga kelihatan memiliki polis yang mengekspresikan mereka adalah negara agama walaupun tidak secara terang-terangan tapi dalam praktek politik sehari-hari itu terjadi mungkin ada review yang diperlukan untuk ini untuk memahami fakta-fakta terbaru walaupun dunia mengarah pada sekularisasi dan pengakuan ketidakberagamaan tapi hampir seluruh agama-agama dunia mementingkan pengaruh politik dan mereka bekerja seserius-seriusnya di seluruh dunia tidak ada absen mereka ketika ada pertarungan suksesional lokal negara bahkan tingkat-tingkat lokal katolik bermain protestan bermain islam bermain saya kira itu merupakan bagian dari state police kemudian historical factors di Indonesia kita melihat bahkan ketika dideklarasikan menjadi negara merdeka sangat syarat dengan uh, pernyataan tentang nilai-nilai agama dan nilai-nilai agama ini adalah khas merujuk kepada Islam ini juga terjadi di berbagai negara termasuk di Cina dan klaim-klaim hal seperti itu akan menjadi ramuan bumbu untuk klaim hegemoni pada yang lain 
mereka merasa dirinya adalah uh, pewaris utama yang tidak boleh di challenge oleh siapapun. Di kedua tempat juga political factors berlaku. Bahwa Indonesia misalnya sekarang ini secara politik Islam itu cukup lemah. Karena itu dia tidak memperoleh hal-hal yang sepatutnya dia dapat dari penyelenggaraan negara dan pemerintahan. Apalagi ekonomi. Kalau kita bicara ekonomi misalkan, statistik tentang kemiskinan itu adalah gambaran tentang umat Islam. Indonesia negara yang begitu subur dan karena kesuburannya itu mengundang anam negara secara bergantian menjajahnya di sini. Tapi hingga hari ini 75 tahun merdeka tetap juga tergantung kepada bahan pangan dari luar. Nah, ada faktor khas yang tadi juga dijelaskan oleh Pak Fadil di Cina yang menyebabkan bertambahnya kesulitan bagi teman-teman kita minoritas di sana. Lalu kemudian, tren dari pandangan dunia. Mungkin ini sesuatu yang sukar untuk dipahami kecuali merujuk kepada kontestasi agama besar dunia, khususnya Islam dan Kristen, sejak Perang Salib. Bahwa saya mengatakan itu ada sebuah kelanjutan belaka yang dalam berbagai manifestasinya terjadi di seluruh dunia. Dan itu belum akan berakhir. Untuk Indonesia, wrestling antara satu dan ideologi yang lain terus menerus terjadi untuk memperebut hak asuh terhadap negara. Dan itu uh, tidak akan pernah usai sebelum ada mayoritas yang memenangkan itu dan mampu mendominasi. Di Indonesia kan ada numerical majority, tapi technical minority itu Islam. Jadi saya melihat akar masalah ini ada beberapa faktor itu. Saya ulangi religious character followed by the majority of the population, kemudian state policy, historical factors, political factors, and trends of the world view. Adalah karena trends of the world views sehingga ada kesulitan kita untuk mewartakan penderitaan teman-teman kita di Uyghur hingga sekarang. Orang merasa Anda bagian dari ISIS, Anda tidak jujur, Anda macam-macam. Jadi mutu informasi ini dianggap minor. Tadi Profesor Fajil sudah sedikit banyaknya menggambar hal seperti itu. Saya melangkah kepada slide yang terakhir. Saya tidak akan lama-lama. Apa yang harus kita buat? Sebagian ini akan menjadi pengulangan bagi apa yang disarankan oleh Profesor Fajil tadi. Pertama, encouraging Islamic kekuah. Bagaimana caranya? Kita sebetulnya tidak hanya memiliki PBB dan asosiasi-asosiasi antar bangsa yang lainnya. Baik di bidang cultural, ekonomi, dan lain sebagainya. Tapi ada yang sejak uh, puluhan tahun yang lalu, paling tidak enam nasional uh, asosiasi asosiasi Islam antar dunia, OKI, dan macam-macam itu. Tetapi, Ini tidak seberwibawa organisasi-organisasi yang lain dan nyaris tidak dengar. Ketika beberapa bulan lalu atau katakanlah tahun lalu terjadi komunikasi bersama kelompok-kelompok tertentu untuk meminta Cina secara resmi mengakhiri apa yang mereka lakukan terhadap Uyghur dan Xinjiang, maka terjadi pengelompokan. yang menyebabkan dunia muslim pun tidak mungkin bersatu dalam uh, kalimatun wahidah. Kemudian yang kedua, promoting the priority of education and economic development for muslim communities. Sebetulnya kalau menyuarakan hal seperti ini dari Indonesia adalah tertawaan bagi dunia internasional. Tapi saya harus mengumumkan itu. 
Karena generally Muslim would berpenyakit ekonomi dan education. Mereka harus uh, ditingkatkan human development indexnya agar bisa menchallenge tantangan-tantangan baru dan mengalter pikiran-pikiran yang menentang eksistensinya. We could also the current is very weak, but the use of media to increase the effectiveness of Islamic conscientiousness in the world is very important. Saya tadi mencatat Profesor Pajil bahwa komunikasi mulut ke mulut, storytelling, story, ya yeah, storytelling dari lain dari satu klien orang itu dianggap sangat penting. Saya setuju itu, tetapi bagaimana menapikan kekuatan media yang luar biasa menapikan kebenaran-kebenaran Islam yang terjadi dan mempersulit kita untuk perjuangkan nasib yang dialami seperti teman-teman kita di Xinjiang juga di Rohingya dan kemarin di India yang secara terang-terangan membuat undang-undang yang sangat diskriminatif dan saya merasa kok masih ada undang-undang seperti ini di abad 21 tapi dunia diam saja mengenai itu. Lalu kemudian, saran ke empat ini sebetulnya adalah dengan melihat posisi-posisi tertentu yang secara potensial seyogianya bisa dimainkan. Indonesia misalnya dengan posisi sebagai mayoritas peluk Islam dan dengan sumber dayanya sebetulnya bisa membuka bergening dengan kekuatan-kekuatan dunia terutama Cina misalkan tapi dalam proyek OBOR atau Belt Road Initiative Indonesia itu alia itu sufla tangan di bawah dan tidak memiliki bergening Padahal kalau dicoba di challenge itu, Xi Jinping, you bisa membuat apa saja untuk mengembangkan ulang jalur sutra dan perdagangan bebas untuk membentuk khilafah baru yang Anda inginkan. Termasuk melakukan apa saja yang Anda inginkan di Indonesia. Tapi biayanya itu adalah biaya Anda total 100% dan kemudian semua fasilitas infrastruktur yang Anda bangun dengan uang Anda sendiri itu akan kita gunakan bersama Cina, Indonesia dan seluruh negara-negara yang berhajat untuk itu tapi diplomasi itu tidak pernah terjadi malah utang tambah utang dan ini menjadi satu kesulitan baru saya membaca laporan dari sebuah lembaga yang memiliki kredibilitas dalam penelitian dan promosi yang menunjukkan bagaimana kecemasan orang-orang di tiga daerah termasuk Sumatera Utara, Sulawesi dan satu lagi itu tentang proyek obor atau Belt Road inisiatif ini terutama karena ada kekhawatiran bahwa Cina akan melakukan pemasukan warga negara baru secara gelap sehingga nanti secara demokratik etnis Cina Indonesia bisa menduduki urutan ketiga setelah Jawa dan Sunda karena sejak awal pemerintah kita ini sudah mendeklarasikan program yang disebut dengan turism dengan kerjasama kepada Cina untuk mendatangkan turis-turis Cina sebanyak 10 juta kalau itu tambah 10 juta atau lebih dari itu, maka komposisi demokrat Indonesia akan berubah. Di Cina akan menempati terus ketiga. Demokrasi Indonesia yang mengukur legitimasi dari mayoritas sistem dalam pemilihan akan lebih terjamin untuk 
terampas dari ya Islam. Relatif division ke depan akan semakin besar di situ. Lalu yang terakhir, encouraging good institution to be fair. Ya, tadi Pak Fajir juga mengungkapkan hal ini saya kira, tidak hanya terbatas pada media, bagaimana cara untuk memberikan mereka pengertian tentu tidak mudah. Dan meminta mereka untuk merasa kasihan itu tidak kamus. Saya kira itu yang ingin saya sampaikan. Saya berucap terima kasih kepada Pak Profesor Burhan dan Fadil. Tentu saja apa yang saya kemukakan seakan-akan mewakili mindset, cara berpikir orang Indonesia sebagaimana tadi dikritik oleh Pak uh, Fadil. Ada kekurangan kita dalam akses informasi dan kita berdebat sangat keras di antara sama kita tentang kebenaran informasi yang terjadi Uyghur dan Xinjiang itu. Pak Fajir tadi menunjukkan fakta bahwa ada dua organisasi besar yang saya akan akan bersumpah kami lebih tahu kami sudah ke sana dan, dan uh, membuat uh, alay kami menjadi bimbang apa sebetulnya yang terjadi di uh, Cina itu. Forum ini sesuatu yang bermanfaat bagi kita semua dan saya berharap Surya bisa mengenage nanti sesuatu yang lebih besar. Dicatatkanlah hasil-hasil pertemuan ini untuk publikasi sehingga banyak orang mendengarnya. Di Indonesia, informasi tentang hal ini sangat dibutuhkan sekali. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, terima kasih uh, webinar ini dalam dua bahasa bahasa Inggris dan bahasa Indonesia. Jadi silahkan sekarang kita masuk sesi tanya jawab. We are entering the discussion session. I see that Pak Hairuman uh, has raised uh, his hand. Pak Hairuman uh, mengangkat tangan. Silahkan Pak Hairuman kalau ingin menanggapi atau mengomentari. Pak Hairuman, Pak Hairuman harap. Ada tanggapan atau komentar terhadap presentasi sejauh ini? Tola do bahasa gunung tua bilang. Ya, silakan silakan. Nanti akan saya terjemahkan kalau bahasa Batak sekalipun. Uh, saya baru masuk ini, saya belum mengikuti secara persis apa yang menjadi topik perdebatan. Tapi saya halo. Halo. Ya, sila, silakan silakan. Ya terus terus. Uh, tapi saya melihat apa ya apa itu uh, perdebatan masalah uh, masyarakat Islam di, di 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 China di China di masyarakat Uyghur. Uh, Cuma saya belum dapat poin apa yang menjadi uh, uh, pembicaraan dari teman-teman sekalian. Saya Uh, mengucapkan selamat atas uh, webinar ini. Uh, uh, memang ini perbincangan lama kita sebenarnya tentang bagaimana uh, masyarakat Islam uh, diperlakukan di negeri Cina. Dan saya tangkap trial dari Pak Sohibul itu adalah uh, bagaimana uh, demagogi daripada demografi daripada Indonesia yang uh, uh, sangat diinfiltrasi oleh uh, uh, datangnya para turis yang 10 juta. Nah, sedangkan uh, kita tahu pengamanan daripada uh, imigran kita itu sangat lemah. Ya sangat lama sehingga kita kesulitan mendeteksi dan mengawasi para pendatang-pendatang uh, uh, yang uh, bermukim akhirnya di Indonesia. Saya pikir itu catatan penting kita sebetulnya sistem uh, pengawasan daripada orang asing, pora pengawasan orang asing yang harus Uh, lebih kita tingkatkan sistemnya. Nah, ini memang yang menjadi kelemahan kita 
terutama karena ada budaya korupsi yang merajalela di Indonesia. Kira itu saja dulu. Sementara itu, terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, so, I will translate what he said to English for the benefit of the audience later in YouTube. He is very concerned, Pak Hairuman is very concerned about the issue. And uh, he appreciates this webinar very much. And uh, there are a lot of problems which needs to be resolved. And we'll pay attention later to the materials of this webinar because he joined late and he didn't really get uh, the presentation from the previous time. Saya katakan bahwa nanti semua materi-materi ini ini direkam uh, webinar kita ini dan nanti materi-materi ini dapat dilihat di YouTube yang akan saya kirimkan tautannya kemudian uh, bit titikli dari Smiring Surya Channel nanti akan saya kirimkan juga secara pribadi uh, singkatnya Pak Hiruman tidak memiliki pertanyaan uh, Fazil, uh, do you have any response to uh, Burhan, Burhan, to Sulibo, to Pak Hiruman, do you have any response uh, to comments, the other presentations uh, so far? Um, I was very happy to hear uh, both presentations. Uh, in particular, uh, from Professor Burhan, I learned a lot more about, um, I appreciate the fact that he told his story. And uh, like I said, stories are very important. Uh, they make us, you know, give us a, a more complete idea of what's happening, a more full, uh, full picture. I think I'm definitely going to try to, you know, download his uh, that article about, you know, that he shared with us. And uh, so, yeah, but I, I definitely appreciated both speakers and, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Burhan uh, is praying uh, Asar. Unfortunately, I scheduled the webinar for three hours. So we are ending in a few minutes, maybe even in one minute. Uh, later, I will say my personal thanks to him. Nanti saya akan ucapkan terima kasih secara khusus pada Prof. Burhan, dia lagi soal asar di Turki ya. Jadi uh, semua peserta webinar, terima kasih telah menghadiri ini. Terima kasih Pak Hairuman, Bu Dahlena, Pak Tul, Jannah, Muhammad Tikwanadi, Pak Dato Imam Manazuki, Pak Doktor, Pak Ade Nugraha, and to the speakers uh, Sohibul, Fazil, and Burhan. Uh, later you can see, as I said, the video on YouTube, and I will include all the information that I have found there. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. Alhamdulillah, we have finished this webinar successfully. Let's pray for our Uyghur brothers and Where's sisters. One? And I hope that everything will be better for us in the near future. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay.